esta sesión, eh, presentar sobre todo a Ana Gabriela, a Carolina Quiroga y eh, a la, al grupo de Entre Líneas que además hoy por la tarde presenta su magnífico libro. Espero que todo vaya muy bien eh, con eso. Um, las uh, sesiones de pre-eventos han ido todas muy bien, avanzando bastante de manera interesante. En este caso tenemos un, un grupo connotado de, de investigadoras que se ha dedicado ya durante mucho tiempo a poner en evidencia algo que Uh, había quedado un poquito desplazado en la propia historia, que era la presencia de la mujer en, en la historia de la arquitectura. Y sabemos además que en relación con la arquitectura moderna es relativamente central. Uh, para ello, hoy oh, sí, gracias, uh, gracias Claudio. Claudio, sorry, Claudio, just uh, tell me that it, it should be in English, sorry. Uh, I just uh, finished a conference in, in, in English, so I, I must do it. I must uh, go ahead in the same language. Sorry for the people who is trying to understand uh, uh, Spanish, mostly Sophie uh, from, from Delft uh, and probably someone else. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we have uh, this session with a uh, with a uh, very what what can i say very uh, um, prestigious uh, um, researchers on the on the women women participation in modern architecture and as i i um, I will introduce the people from the research group Entre Líneas, Manola Ugalde, Barbara Rosas, uh, Valentina Rojas y Javiera um, Rodríguez, uh, who are going to, to present uh, two alternatives on one on most uh, panoramic view, another Uh, on a very uh, intense case study. And also Ana Gabriela Godinho Lima, she is going to introduce the, the role of the women in Latin American architecture and uh, Carolina Quiroga, mostly related with the Argentinian uh, women in architecture. As uh, in, in the three cases, we put, uh, Uh, pictures. Uh, the first one is from from um, Kika Schweizer, the the uh, municipality of Valdivia. The second was the participation of Delfina Galvez in the direction of the construction of the uh, La Casa sobre el Arroyo, which. Uh, Uh, designed and built with uh, uh, Amancio Williams. And in the case of Ana Gabriela, the magnific bowl chair from Lina Bobardi with, uh, with the women uh, sitting on, on it. Uh, so Ana Gabriela, she's professor from, from the Mackenzie University in, in Sao Paulo, and she's devoted to The, the role of women in architecture in Latin America for so, so, so many years. Uh, Carolina Quiroga, she's founder of LINA. LINA is a platform to uh, visibilize the, the women powerful uh, relationship with uh, modern architecture. And uh, Manola, Barbara, Valentina and Javiera are members of the Entre Líneas, and as I recently said, they are going to present the book on uh, the research she, they, they run uh, for uh, one year and a half, maybe, on, on the women in architecture in Chile. 
So thank you so much for being here. I don't remember the, the order, but please, Trils, uh, you can uh, tell me the order. First is Ana Gabriela. Okay, so Ana Gabriela, go ahead. And then Carolina, and then entre líneas in uh, Manola and, and Barbara in the first time, and Javiera uh, and Valentina in the second. So go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Horacio, for your presentation. It's a great pleasure to be here with my colleagues discussing and reflecting about the role of women architects in Latin America. Uh, can you hear me uh, very, uh, well? It's well, everything yes. okay. Uh, I would like to confirm how much time do I have for my presentation? Uh, half an hour. Half an hour, okay. I'll try to be. Yeah, it should be. Okay, I think it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me share my, my here. And the presentation. Everybody can see it well? Yes. Good. Yes. So uh, what I want to uh, present to you today is uh, a part of an ongoing research, uh, an ongoing survey, uh, trying to uh, identify in master thesis and uh, master and thesis uh, research, uh, how women actors are being studied, surveyed, documented, and acknowledged. Uh, so I would like to start with this uh, temporal landmark, which was which took place in 2019. And, and I would like to call it the farewell to Benicio Diaz building designed by Nisha Borman. Uh, Nisha Borman was an architect uh, acknowledged as one of the introducers of modern architecture in Fortaleza, Brazil. And this year, 2019, marks the year where, when her building, Benicio Diogenes, were demolished. And this is very significant because it was the same year when my Erika Martins and her co-authors presented this article in the Documomo Conference in Salvador 2019, uh, which is called Nisa Borman and the Context of the Introduction of Modern Architecture in Fortaleza. So uh, since then, since 2019, it kept with me and my team the idea that uh, the less women architects are acknowledged in modern architecture, the more is easy to demolish and destruct the modern heritage they had, they took part into uh, designing and building. So uh, 2019 marks this um, encounter, the same year when uh, Nisa Borman uh, is approached, is presented in a Dokomomo conference, is the year where um, an important building designed by her is distracted. Uh, and then uh, we could relate, we could see this, uh, what Giovanna Merli, another researcher, had, has been doing. And she, uh, in her research, which she has defended in Concepcion Chile this year, uh, she um, observed that in the main Brazilian academic database, the CAPES Thesis Bank, there is a um, very shocking, I would say, low proportion of works dedicated to the tra trajectory of work or work of women architects. Many have found that among 19,049 19, academic masters and doctorate degrees in architecture and urbanism, 107 address the trajectory of work of women architects or work of women architects. And among these 107, 70 address some aspects of Lina Bobadge's career, which of course is understandable because Lina Bobadge is one of the uh, exceptionals. Uh, I, I think that the 
name of this platform, what Asia mentioned, and we will hear soon, uh, perhaps is related to Lina Bobadi. So it's understandable that she has the the greater the greatest attention, but uh, it leaves us with 37 other words about women actors. Who are these women? Um, who, and who are the other women actors that have been addressed in masters and doctoral theses that are related to the modern heritage? So this research, as I said, is an ongoing an ongoing research. It's not uh, yet finished, and we are trying to. Uh, acknowledge who are and where are these women actors related to the modern architecture. And what we see is that we have some architects who are related to the Sao Paulo Rio de Janeiro axis. Why do I call it Sao Paulo Rio de Janeiro axis? Because for a long time, uh, the history of uh, Brazilian modern architecture was predominantly about this axis, Sao Paulo Rio de Janeiro which are located in the southeast, southeastern region of Brazil. And of course, there are important schools in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, and many of the masters like Oscar Niemeyer uh, is from, from Rio de Janeiro, or João Batista Villanova Artigas is from Sao Paulo. And, <clears throat> and of course, there is a great impact of the uh, schools in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in the modern architecture in Brazil. Nevertheless, in the recent years, the last decades, uh, lots of revisions of the modern architecture history are putting more importance in other regions in Brazil. And the northern and northeastern region is not, are now being more acknowledged and have more attention. And it's interesting to see that we can see also some women actors being researched, uh, receiving attention uh, in this region and the south of the south. Of course, Chile is more south than this, <clears throat> the more south than our south, but as South America, there are some works being done in the south of Brazil, trying to acknowledge what is happening in the south. What is uh, shocking, I would say, uh, is the small number. Uh, we are already in 2023, and there is still a small number of works of uh, dedicated to modern with women architects. And of course, I think we have to consider some obstacles. These obstacles are not the focus of my presentation. Nevertheless, I think it's important to <clears throat> mention them. The first obstacle is to find material about women, modern women architects. Uh, some of these archives were destructed. Many of these architects didn't know or didn't consider their work was irrelevant in any way. And <clears throat> so they didn't keep, they didn't keep the, their files, their drawings, their sketches, photos, and everything. So it's very difficult to uh, access this kind of material. Also, uh, even when the material exists, sometimes in the graduate programs, graduate architecture and urban, urbanism programs, there, is, there are lots of resistances. And the resistances to this kind of research comes from, uh, sometimes there aren't supervisors who are qualified to supervise uh, research about women, a, women, a woman architect or women in architecture. And this happens because uh, as we already know, researching women in architecture is not the same as researching men in architecture. There, there, are, there, are not, there is now a great body of knowledge and theoretical perspectives that show that there are reasons why uh, women had some kinds of trajectories, had some kinds of participations and some kinds of results. And sometimes in graduate architecture and urbanism uh, programs, uh, this kind of knowledge is not so available. So this is a kind, this is a kind of this is an obstacle for uh, researchers who try, who, who, who wants to research, to dedicate their research to women actors. And also when there is the, the, the possibility of researching the, the 
the, a woman architect. And when there is material uh, from her file, from her office, uh, still in this case, it's very challenging to position her in the history of architecture. Uh, so I am mentioning three kinds of obstacles that may be uh, operating when we see uh, such a uh, small number of researchers, at least in Brazil. Uh, the, first, uh, the first kind of research we find is, uh, as I told the Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro access protagonists. And of course, Lina Bobadge is here and I, uh, I won't develop a lot uh, about Lina because I think she's such an exceptional character that I would prefer to discuss a little bit more the other architects. And also I didn't mention every one of the 70 words dedicated to her because there's a lot. And uh, as I said before, it's not the focus on, of my presentation today. But there are other architects like Rosa Grena Clias. And Rosa Clias have received recently uh, a distinction by our Council of Architecture and Urbanism in Sao Paulo. And for us, this is very important because as we see these architects receiving this distinctions, this kind of opens the door for more researchers about her. So if a researcher, especially a researcher, desires to research Rosa Grena Clears, now Rosa Clears is so um, uh, acknowledged that this uh, candidate to doing the research will find a more open way to research Rosa Grena Clears. Nevertheless, we find uh, one work uh, mentioning Rosa Clears. Uh, this is a dissertation. And of course, there may be more, and I apologize because we uh, this is a, still an ongoing survey and it's very likely there, there are more, but we are focusing in uh, masters and doctoral thesis who have in, the, in their title or in their abstract, some, uh, some kind of mention of women architects recognition or modern women architects recognition. And Rosa Lena so appears in one work, one dissertation. And the works, it is very important too. Uh, we are here dedicating attention to architects who had their design and built work featured in this research. So this is very important. In This is a kind of um, a frame in our research. We are not uh, dedicating attention to women actors who are mentioned by their trajectories, by their research or by their uh, teaching uh, trajectory. We are dedicating attention to women who had their design and built work featured in the uh, researches, in the master research or doctoral researches. And then we have Mayumi Watanabe de Souza Lima, uh, also from Sao Paulo. Mayumi Watanabe, well, uh, some of you may uh, um, understandably say that I am forcing a little bit her, pres her presence here because she was not the main architect who, design who designed these apartment buildings in Brasilia. And she's actually more uh, acknowledged by her work with children and the city and the children. Nevertheless, uh, as she appears in the work of jo Giovanna Merli as an important, uh, an important protagonist who is, uh, uh, who, who is studied by master and doctoral thesis, I, I understood that it was really important to bring her here. And Mayumi Watanabe de Souza Lima uh, take, took too long to be acknowledged. She uh, unfortunately is dead for a long time now, and only now uh, or in recent years, she's been acknowledged by her work and especially by being a pioneer who understood the importance of designing the city dedicated to children. So uh, it's by this recognition that now her, her other works and her traje trajectory in architecture is being uh, studied and recognized. And we have also in Sao Paulo, Odileia Sete Toscano, 
uh, who was married to Walter Toscano, who is a very well-known uh, Paulista and Brazilian actor. And Odileia, the, the impact of Odileia in Walter Toscano's work is yet to be studied. Uh, we know that Odileia was very close to Walter Toscano. They developed uh, lots of works together. They were very, uh, they had a very strong partnership. And when we see this project, uh, this uh, 13 de Mayo station in Sao Paulo, we see that the rhythm of the structure is, ma is matching with the panels that uh, Odileia designed. Odileia, uh, her tra trajectory is mainly in art and design. And, but nevertheless, we see, especially in this work, how the art and architecture are intertwined and conceived. I think we can say that they are conceived uh, in an integrated manner. So um, I think it's very important. Uh, Odileia Toscano is only now being acknowledged. This, this work, uh, this thesis that I bring here is from 2023. So it's yesterday, practically. And it's important to, uh, to see that Walter Toscano architecture can be better understood when we uh, take Odileia Toscano part into view and vice versa. So uh, the, the role of partnerships uh, is still beginning to be more uh, studied. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. But in this case, Odileia Toscano just now received one, one master, master thesis dedicated exclusively to her. And then here we have Carmen Portinho. Carmen Portinho is an exceptional. Uh, she's from Rio de Janeiro and she's an engineer. And she was acknowledged as a very important protagonist uh, also recently. And what is important to say is that, uh, well, you are seeing here very important projects that are commonly attributed to only to Afonso Eduardo Heiji. But none of these projects would have been possible without Carmen Portinho. So uh, the acknowledgement of her work, the, her ways of work and her participation in, in the existence of important architectural landmarks such as uh, Conjunto Residencial Pedregulho and Museu de Arte Moderna do Rio, uh, which you are seeing here, is yet to be more understood and uh, acknowledged. And the first time uh, I understand that, uh, uh, that the first time she was mentioned in a master thesis was in 1999, uh, when the, this uh, what a panorama in this work, Arquitectos and Arquitecturas na América Latina do Século XX was made. And in 2022, she's still appearing as an important figure, an important protagonist who is uh, recurringly appearing in masters and doctoral researches. And then we come to the northern and north, north, northeastern region of Brazil. And uh, I wanted to show the, the cover of this doctoral thesis by Leticia Brenner Ramalho, because I, I think she was very precise choosing this photograph. This is a, a building by the architect Zélia Maia Nobre. And as we can see, this building is, um, in, it's not in a very bad shape, in very good shape. And this is very common in uh, works of Zélia Maia Nobre. We will come back to this in a minute. I, was, I would like just to mention a book. Uh, remembering I'm not talking about books or articles. I'm talking here about specifically masters and doctoral thesis. But uh, this book from Maria Angelica da Silva is the more mentioned book we can find when we see these researches because she was uh, definitely a pioneer mentioned in 1991 uh, women actors in Alagoas. And the architects she mentions are mainly Ligia Fernandes, Maria do Carmo Schaub, and Zélia Maia Nobre. Uh, 
And these were such, imp such important artifacts that we find amazing that we are only now uh, seeing this uh, protagonist appearing uh, in this master and doctoral thesis, uh, cons especially considering that the book by Maria Angelica da Silva is from 1991. So Zélia Maia Nobre, we unfortunately lost Zélia Maia Nobre in July this year. And it's such a, cha a shame that her works are not yet uh, protected in any way. So we have here the, the central picture is Parque Hotel Recife in Pernambuco. And the left, the right picture is the Arted House. And we see they are not in very good shape. Uh, the Parque Hotel Recife is, is considered an, an, an exemplary because it takes into account, into account so many climatic solutions. So in such a hot climate, such as Recife in Pernambuco, uh, Zélia Nobre works with many, many uh, climatic solutions. Um, and also she qualifies the, the surroundings uh, in a way that is at the same time very uh, respectful and at the same time qualifies a lot the, the surroundings uh, where she builds. And it's considered a very important building in her career. And nevertheless, it doesn't receive any kind of uh, attention in terms of conservation, uh, so uh, as far as we know until now. And the Arctic House is now abandoned and it's not, no use at all and risking to, to be ruined. And I think it's a, well, sorry, it's a positive thing that now she's receiving a lot more attention. And we have at least three doctor and master thesis mentioned in her works, being this last, the first one, Hamadio Leticia, a doctoral research specially dedicated to her work, Zélia Mayanobre. Uh, another actor, Nisa Pais Burman, as I mentioned before, uh, her, her building edificio Benicio Diogenes uh, was demolished in 2019. And she's an actor who received the, the attention of, this, of, of her dissertation especially about her trajectory. And it's interesting to see how climatic solutions, how uh, the mixing between climates and modern architecture solutions are always present in her work. And, and at the same time, how much time it took her to be acknowledged for a long time. Her work, it was not known. And even she didn't know or didn't think her work was special. And well, now it's gone. Now it's to be Benicio Diogenes is gone. And at least we have the attention and the, uh, and, the, and lots of research or some research being made about her work. And now we have Lisa Fernandes. Lisa Fernandes is a very interesting case because she worked with, with Oscar Niemeyer she worked with uh, Lucio Costa. She worked with many, many of the important uh, modern masters in Brazilian architecture. And she worked also with Francisco Bologna. Her story is a story uh, intertwined with many, many uh, names of Brazilian modern architecture. And uh, she was mentioned in my Angelica da Silva work in 1991, and then again in 1999, in this uh, survey about women actors in Latin America, and then again in this work in 2018. But what we see is that this always the same material is being brought again and again. And the same, uh, we have, uh, we can say, we have such a few more research about her trajectory, her works, and the, the documents she produced uh, in terms of master and doctoral thesis. And another architect that, that is very uh, little known is Eji Marreta Timotio. Uh, now she appears in two uh, doctoral theses. Uh, 
one of them in 2018, and then another in 2023. Uh, it's about, she works with Zelia Maria Nobre, in, and she works in Fortaleza. And there is so few data about Eji Marreta Timotio that uh, when I talk about her, it's kind of an invitation. Let's know more about it, her. She appears like um, uh, an, someone almost always in the shadows. Uh, a little, uh, it's kind of what happens with, uh, with lots of wives of architects. I could mention, for instance, the wife of Joaquin Guedes, uh, who uh, nobody knows. Uh, and she had a work and a participation in, in his work that was determining to his uh, preeminence to, to the acknowledgement of his work. And nobody talks about her. So Ejimahita Chimotu is one of these cases. She's almost completely in the shadows, but now some twilight sometimes uh, allows us to see uh, where she is. And then we, ha we have Janete Costa, which, well, she's a little bit more known because she had a very prominent career in uh, interior architecture, but she had also a very interesting partnership with his husband, with her husband, uh, which was, who was Gil Borsoi. Gil Borsoi was an architect, a very well-known architect in Recife, and he had a special role in modern architecture in Brazil. And Janete Costa is very much understood as someone apart or so, or, or never even acknowledged as, as someone who had interfered or participated in any way in Gil Borsoi architecture. But Andrea Gatti Porto in her uh, thesis uh, acknowledges and uh, understands that Janete Costa has a more important role that uh, we are used to uh, attribute to her um, in Gil Borsoi's architecture and by extension in the modern architecture in Brazil. And then uh, I am uh, heading to the end. We have the South of the South with such a few works. One of them is about this uh, Argentinian architect, Itala Fulvia Villa. And I included it here because it was a, uh, a master thesis developed in Brazil. But looking at an American, a Latin American architecture, architect who is not in Brazil. So this is another thing that uh, we are dedicating some attention. Why don't uh, Brazilian researchers are looking more at Latin American women architects? And this is this was the only example we found until now. And the other dissertation is still ongoing, is uh, the Clarissa Terra dissertation talking about and mentioning, among other women architects, Vera Fabricio, who we could relate or we could insert into the modern uh, architecture, well, uh, amplified uh, domain. And Vera Fabricio, is one of the architects who is still yet to be well more known. Clarissa Terra is still organizing and systematizing the material, but we hope that uh, when she finishes her uh, dissertation, we have a more comprehensive view of this architect. And we see that in the Southern region of Brazil, we have less recognition, less participation, or less research about uh, women architects, uh, in general, and modern women, women actor specifically, and which leaves us wondering why there are so few researches uh, about women actors in modernity, and why are so few research about what they have designed and built. And I think my time is finished, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ana Gabriela. I think it's now the, the moment to hear uh, Carolina Quiroga. Please, Carolina, go ahead.
Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues talking about it. And, uh, sorry. Yes, what um, I like to talk about, not about the specific research, but about some questions uh, about women architects in general and specifically in Argentina. And um, when I studied architecture, uh, or every student in the School of Architecture, um, this 1929 is a very important year, specifically uh, in the teaching, but also in the historiography of architecture, because uh, Le Corbusier was in Buenos Aires, and uh, because the, uh, Alejandro Bustillo built uh, the one of the first modern buildings in Buenos Aires for uh, the writer Victorio Campo. And uh, another thing is what it was the origin of modern architecture in Argentina was the uh, reference of European architects. And uh, so this was, if you see all the, the first historiography about modern architecture was about this. The influence of Europe, the really important presence of uh, the masters of architecture like Le Corbusier and others. And uh, this house is hardly mentioned. Uh, but if we go back two years ago, um, Victorio Campo, in the city of Mar del Plata near Buenos Aires, built a summer house uh, herself, designed by herself. And she was not architect, she was a writer. And uh, she did this house, in my opinion, the first modern house um, with the help of a constructor. And uh, this house is really not mentioned in any. Uh, publication is after the 80s start to be there. But um, so after that, she built this house with uh, Alejandro Bustillo, who was very uh, reticent to, to the house, to the design, to the modernity. And uh, another not specifically mentioned is she was promoter of architecture, modern architecture. So uh, with Previch, Le Corbusier, and she promote, and also in the magazines and all these um, relevant buildings were promoted by her. So my first question is, when start modernity? And the second is, what is an architect? Because she did architecture, she started this um, idea. And I think one point, I think Anna mentioned that, is very hard um, to research about women architects, uh, not only because the difficulty to uh, find the documentation, but also about to understand uh, what is architecture. No, it's not only to build is not only uh, to be professional. And um, so after that, in the same year, 1929, uh, uh, the first woman, uh, Filandia Pizul, was graduated in Argentina. And uh, at that moment, uh, officially, the women started to practice architecture. Uh, but about it, I like to remark again, was not true about this uh, modern uh, beginning of architecture here. 
um, about the um, evaluating, you know, about Docomomo, about this statement, what is know and evaluate and document research conserve uh, about um, the no, I think, uh, to understand what happens with the woman in architecture. In Argentina was very relevant, the, the work of uh, Un Dia, Un Architecture, the collective. And I really like to mention that um, started by Ines Moset and a very important group of people who collaborate in this visibilization. Anna is part of that. Uh, very active and important uh, moment. Uh, and uh, after the vision of uh, Philandia Pisul, um, in Argentina there were many groups and very well groups about modern architecture. One of this is Austral Group. And uh, there were two women architects, one Itala Fulvivilia, and uh, this is interesting because uh, was the um, relevance about the importance of women architects at that moment, and was really to change what we learn in the architectural faculties. And as you see, she studied with this academic style, uh, with the ornaments in architecture, and very few years later, uh, with uh, Violeta Lorraine Puchkin, other uh, pioneer woman architect in uh, Argentina, uh, they built together this building that Anna also mentioned. And this building is also not the well known about uh, the beginning of this Astral group, but um, I think it's a, a very innovative uh, at that moment, uh, also not also about the form and aesthetic, also about the functioning, and uh, was very uh, relevant. And I think some kind of inspiration, for example, for this building of Ferrari Ardoi, who have very uh, similarities with the <laughs> Itela Fulvia Villa and Violeta Lorraine Puchkin. Uh, so after this point, so second, my second statement is, is necessary to be uh, deeper on the know about uh, these groups of modernity. Um, about the pioneer architects, it's good mention to Delfina Galvez Bunge with Amancia Williams, who is very well known about experimentation and also about the new forms of uh, representation architecture. But uh, if you go deeper, to, uh, it's interesting to you know uh, as Delfina who did all these drawings in the office because she was painter and she represent this interesting and really more um, sensitive way to understand the landscape, for example, in this house. And she was also landscape architect. No, she was a very important for the landscape of all this project in the office of Amancia Williams. In office, we can find uh, the architect, Colette Bocara, uh, who was uh, part of the team with uh, Cesar Janello and Jorge Butler of this very innovative building, this suspended building office. And um, they did together the design and Colette Bucaria also is not <laughs> mentioned in not all the bibliography. And uh, about that, she were very, um, also now it's very interesting how Colette Bocara is really uh, recognized by, about her designs and about the industrial designs. Uh, um, so after that, uh, another 
thing is the pioneer architects uh, start in Buenos Aires, but uh, later, later in the time, uh, the other architecture schools in Argentina, uh, Cordoba, Rosario, Tucumán, um, and in Cordoba, the first one was Nelida Aspilicueta, who did a very uh, important work there, not only about modern architecture like this building, uh, also about conservation of heritage and uh, After that, it's possible um, to evaluate the production of uh, pioneers like Cameron Renard, who is author of the Auditorio Juan Vitorica is uh, in San Juan. And this building is national monument. And uh, also Mabel Lapaco, uh, the Manuel Belgrano School, who is um, also national monument. And about this, um, also about the visibilization is um, one is the protection of the building and also the visibilization. For example, a recent exhibition uh, about Matilde Luetic in Rosario. Um, and she did uh, a very important production with Beauty, her partner. Uh, not only in Rosario, also in Misiones, and it was a recent exhibition about the um, visibilization of her work. And uh, another statement in uh, the production of women architects is uh, not only the um, traditional uh, practice in architecture, no, to the office, it's also about the public work, because if it's difficult to find information, documentation about the woman in an office, uh, this is really more hard. And for example, one uh, um, very uh, interesting production is Maria Luisa Garcia Bullios, one of the first and uh, uh, graduated in the University of Buenos Aires, and she did uh, several um, swimming pools in uh, public spaces in Buenos Aires that are really still used. So this is not only the evaluation, but also the continuity of these ideas today and everyday life. Um, another uh, point is the <clears throat> what also is uh, like in Victoria Campo, no? what is the practice of architecture and in this uh, dimension we can find all the architecture promoted and produced by Eva Perón and, uh, and here is another question and so Foundation Eva Perón promotes several um, things for health, but also for social tourism, like the Chapal Malal and uh, in Cordoba um, hotels for holidays for the uh, working class people. And uh, these are still now in the uh, restoration, renovation. And another point again is what is architect now what is the profession of architect and who did the architect and uh, in the public buildings the social um, of architecture in government also Italia Fulvia Villa was um, director of the architectural urban planning in Buenos Aires and she produced one of the most uh, relevant landscape architecture urbanism work that is the underground pantheons in uh, cemetery in the cemetery of Chacarita and uh, this building was not um, was known was a part of everyday life of the people here uh, and uh, but were not protected and by some initiative last year by two collective of architects was possible to declare uh, cultural heritage in the city. And uh, another relevant uh, work was uh, Graciela Hidalgo, for example, in Mendoza working uh, in the government. And this was uh, very well researched by Natalia Daldi and uh, 
other uh, contributions about it, but all these buildings are part of the everyday life and really nobody knows was part of architecture, woman architect. Other dimension is not only to build, but also to register the modernity. And uh, I like to mention Grete Stern, a photographer. She studied in the Bauhaus. She emigrated here uh, and she registered and also lived in modern architect in this house uh, designed by Vladimir Bacosta. And uh, she was part of one aspect interesting of the modernity that was the criticism. Gret Stern was uh, very critical about the a role of women at that moment with this collage in one feminine uh, magazine uh, when she produced these uh, critics about it at that moment in the modern era, what was the role of women and what technology produced about it was not only to help because uh, was woman also slave of this new modern way of life and especially specifically the technology of the house and uh, was critics with this register about the situation in the north of Argentina about the, the very difficult condition and uh, my point here is she was a very good um, with this picture that uh, what kind of things modernity cannot resolve, no? What was the uh, point of the position of modern architecture about these issues? Uh, and she also registered some uh, iconic buildings like this uh, bridge uh, over the stream in Mar de Plata. And uh, this register was relevant because some years ago, uh, I was in uh, holidays, I visited the house, and the house is a national monument, is one of the most uh, well-known buildings around the world in Argentina. And uh, I saw in the site this information, and I found it was only mentioned Amancio Williams. So after that, I went to the uh, declaration of the monument and she was not included in the monument declaration. And this was um, not only a gender issue, was only about disciplinary and a heritage, a very uh, problem. And uh, if you can see, not only in this, this is the um, scope of very specialized people researching about architecture, but in every um, every uh, diffusion dissemination about modern architecture, she is very poor mentioned. No, in publications, uh, websites, not so uh, scientific places. But this is when my first was the students and the community no? knowing about architecture, if you find this house. And this is very also uh, dramatic. No, she's not, she was not mentioned at that moment when I saw this in the archive of uh, Amancy Williams. And uh, after that, with all this documentation, with the photos of Greta Stern and all the documentation uh, about the evidence, she was the partner of the house. She was a, a co-author of the house. I present a report to the National Commission of Monuments and uh, I did myself. And I think this is not good to your Last year we did in a collective group of women, but I present this project to recheck and to uh, re um, think about the declaration of this building. And after that, with all this evidence, the National Commission uh, reviewed the uh, monument um, 
nomination a declaration of the house so after this uh, presentation was the question i go back to the first question about what happened in 1929 uh, happened a lot of things but i think uh, the most interesting thing is um, Finlandia Pistol was architect, but more things happened before. And the second question is about what is architect. And I think it's necessary to go deeper about what is the architect. And I didn't have time, but the women were very important also in research spread, Marina Weisman, for example, and to uh, spread architecture to research Noemi Goitia and not only to produce new architecture about also to preserving architecture like Noemi Gonzalez in Misiones and all around the country. So uh, I think my uh, last uh, phrase is to give some um, hope and some energy to really replicate these actions about to visibilize, to documenting, to research, but also to um, be connected with modern architecture. Because I think uh, the woman did a, a very important contribution that need to be one and one and one and one more uh, research. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, I don't know what, who is coming now, Manola or, or Bobby Rosas. Oh, Manola, I think it is. Okay. Yes, you go we can ahead. go now. Okay, let me share screen. Okay, right. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Manola. Uh, thank you Horacio and Docomo Chile for organizing this pre-event. And uh, thank you Ana, Gabriela and Carolina for your previous presentations. So um, this presentation shows some results of a research project about the history of women architects in Chile which we have developed throughout the three past years, together with uh, Fabiola Solari, Valentina Rojas, and Javiera Rodriguez, who is also present here. We're very happy because, um, as Horacio said before, uh, this evening we will launch our first book. Um, our research has focused on women who studied or worked at the architecture school of our alma mater, Universidad Católica de Chile, or UC, between 1928 and 1979. In particular, this presentation is based on an article of the same name, recently published in Historia Patrimonio magazine. We would also like to highlight that uh, today we will talk about a series of women architects focusing only on one aspect of each of their multifaceted careers, and you might find a more comprehensive view of the trajectories in our book. So the first part is called historiographic review. In the first stage of our research, we analyzed 11 writings, including books and specific chapters about the history of architecture in Chile in the 20th century. All of these writings have a panoramic approach and construct a discourse about modern architecture in Chile. In them, we found 32 female names, including artists, sculptors, clients, patrons, and architects, born in Chile and abroad. If the scope is limited to women architects trained in Chile until 1979, the number lowers to only 14. All of them 
were included in the writings because of their design practice, most of which was developed collectively, meaning with their husbands or as part of a team. All of these women studied in Universidad de Chile and Universidad Católica. While 11 were trained at Universidad de Chile, only three graduated from Universidad Católica. Uh, they are Gloria Barros, Ana Luisa Deves, and Margarita Bizan. This initial historiographic revision raised a series of questions. First, why are only 14 women architects part of narratives? Secondly, why are there more graduates from Universidad de Chile than from Universidad Católica? Uh, thirdly, uh, why do references to women architects focus solely on their practice as designers of buildings? And finally, um, what topics and debates fall into oblivion as a consequence of that decision? Faced with these questions, we realized that we had to expand the conventional definitions of architectural practice so that other previously absent voices of women could emerge. Beyond design, we considered teaching, research, planning, administration, editorial work and political activity. In this presentation, we will only show some key aspects of the diverse professional trajectories of these 20 women architects, most of which are not mentioned in the analyzed writings. All of these women were trained between the 1920s and the 1970s and were somehow linked to Universidad Católica throughout the 20th century as students, professors or researchers. They are figures who were either pioneers in the professional field, who played a leading role in the opening of new disciplinary discussions, or who stood out in forms of practice that were considered peripheral or uh, per peripheral to or uh, less relevant than architectural design. In this, in the group of the pioneers, we include the first two women who enrolled in, in the UC uh, Architecture School. This was in 1928, three years after Dora Riedel became the first woman in Chile to graduate as an architect. Um, she graduated at Universidad de Chile in 1925. By enrolling in the school formed only by men, Maria Elena Vergara Navarrete and Violeta del Campo Moya contributed to the transformation of architecture into a possible professional horizon for women in the country. Maria Elena Vergara graduated in 1935 and had an independent professional practice. In 1943, she became the fifth woman in a total of 114 members to enter the Chilean Architects Union or Colegio de Arquitectos de Chile. She was in charge of the design and construction of the neo-Gothic parish Jesús de Nazareno in Santiago, which was declared a historical conservation property in 2007. Records show that she also designed two houses in Las Condes and a housing complex in a small street in Providencia, named Pasaje Navarrete, probably after her mother. Violeta del Campo, on the other hand, graduated in 1944. By then, she was already working at the City Council of Santiago. In 1956, she was portrayed in Eva magazine together with her colleagues Esther Duran, Mariana Valverde, Aida Ramirez, Graciela Espinosa, and Maria Teresa Rojas. The article, titled The Woman in Architecture, suggests that by 1956, Violeta del Campo had been serving the City Council for 22 years. A set of poems, which were self-published in the 1990s, reflects Del Campo's experience in a male-dominated professional environment. We decided to include another two women in this group who were not pioneers from a temporal point of view, but rather in a disciplinary sense, opening innovative fields of knowledge related to the built environment in Chile. The voice of Joan MacDonald stands out in the area of urban planning and housing. After graduating in 1969, she worked as a researcher at the UC Interdisciplinary Center for Regional Studies, or CIDU. 
This academic experiment focused on the formulation of multidisciplinary approaches to urban development. In 1975, McDonald assumed the leadership of the Department of Housing Planning at the UC Urban Planning Institute. She held the position until 1977, when the institute was dissolved for curricular and political reasons. In a similar manner, Esme Gromi was one of the first active landscape architects in South America. Born in England, she was first trained in topiary arts at the Studley Horticultural College between 1945 and 1947, and later completed a master's degree in landscape architecture at the Harvard GSD. This was between 1948 and 1952. In 1971, she co-created the UCE Department of Environmental Design, or DDA. The department's aim was to explore the interactions between architecture and environment. Also dissolved around 1975, the DDA contributed to the definition of a then new professional field in Chile, landscape architecture. Union representatives. Two voices stand out for their influence as authorities of the Chilean Architects Union. Eliana Caraval Martinez, who graduated in 1965, and Iris Marcic Moller, who graduated in 1977. Between 1986 and 1989, Eliana Caraval served as the first woman president of the Chilean Architects Union. In parallel, she worked as an advisor for the Center for Economic and Social Development of Latin America, or the SAL, and as a university professor. She was also the first woman to be deputy director of the UC School of Architecture between 1980 and 1983. According to her, her decision to take on representative roles aim to raise awareness about women's space in architecture and society. In a similar manner, between 1982 and 1994, Iris Marchis was president of the Sono delegation of Coquimbo region, DC La Serena, of the Chilean Architects Union for three consecutive periods. Especially significant was her work to promote the recognition of the urban and historical value of the area built in the context of La Serena Plan. Due to her distinguished contribution to the union, the meeting room of the regional headquarters were named after her, and in 2001, she was awarded the Alberto Rizzo Patron Prize. In 1986, Marta Riveros Letelier, Letelier sorry, became the first Chilean to join the International Federation of Landscape Architects, or IFLA, Later, she also became the first person to direct its branch in Chile, called uh, the Chilean Institute of Landscape Architects, or ITAP. Besides that, Viveros contributed to debates on landscape architecture within UCE, as a professor of the DDA, as coordinator of summer courses, and as collaborator in the creation of the postgraduate degree in landscape architecture, which was founded in 1989. Deans. Angela Schweitzer Lopetegui and Montserrat Palmer Trias have a lot in common. Both studied at Universidad de Chile, graduating in 1952 and 1961, respectively. Both came to UCE after leaving their jobs at other universities for political reasons, and both were deans of architecture faculties. Angela Schweitzer assumed the direction of the School of Architecture of Universidad del Norte in 1982, which made her the first woman to be the dean of an architecture school in Chile. In that position, she promoted international seminars and two regional extensions of the third and fourth Chilean Architecture Biennale. Her professional link with UCE was built after being exonerated from her position in Antofagasta in 1984. As part of UCE, she continued to deepen the topic she had been studying since the 1960s, how to teach architecture. On the other hand, Monserrat Palmer 
became Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Design and Urban Studies, UCE, in the 2000s. By then, she was well known in the faculty because for 25 years, she had lectured courses and studios, led researches, occupied administration positions, and directed the editorial project ARQ, transforming a small fanzine into an international known, internationally known uh, magazine. Public servants. Like many other women who belong to the first generation of architects in Chile, Esmeralda Rojas Celier worked as a civil servant for a long time. She began her studies in 1929 and graduated in 1944, together with Violeta del Campo. Between 1944 and 1962, she was a member of the State Railway Architecture Department, where she developed working class housing projects. However, the book, Four Centuries of the History of Santiago, published in 1943, shows that before working for the Chilean state, Rojas tried her luck designing houses as an independent architect. Another influential civil servant was Maria Rosa Giuliano Pellerano. In 1972, she became, she became the director of the international competition Remodeling Area in the Center of Santiago, 1972, organized by Cormu. Although she directed the competition, she was not allowed to vote. In the official report, the international jury members expressed their, quote, deep appreciation for the extraordinary dedication and competence of the director. Designers. Miriam Beach Lobos was a member of ICHAP chaired by Viveros. She graduated in 1964 and in 1971 she founded the studio Montalegre Beach Arquitectos in association, association with her husband Alberto Montalegre. As part of the studio, she always tried to link their work with landscape. Her interest in the subject already show, showed in 1960 when she presented her thesis Antecedents for Landscape Architecture. In 1970, she joined the board of directors of the Chile Garden Club. And in 1989, she completed the UCE postgraduate course in landscape architecture. Gloria Barros Infante, on the other hand, graduated in 1965. After that, she worked briefly with Emilio Duarte in Santiago and with Roberto Goicolea in Concepción. In the 1970s, she began to work with Christian de Grote, together with Victor Gavins and Hugo Molina. With them, she designed several industrial, commercial and housing projects, refurbished the El Mercurio de Valparaíso building, and conceived Hotel Ralun in Reloncaví estuary. Due to the latter, Barro's name was included in Quantil's book, Chilean Modern Architecture, since 1950. Professors. Although many of the studied voices work as professors, there are at least two of them whose professional identity was especially, especially marked by academia, Hilda Carmona Lowe and Liliana Lanata Amachi. Hilda Carmona, who graduated in 1954, was the first woman to join the teaching staff of the UCE School of Architecture as a design studio professor. According to the faculty records, she joined the school in 1960. However, her CV suggests that she began to teach in 1955. In parallel with her career as a professor, which stretched until the 1990s, she also had a prominent uh, over as a designer. She worked with Sergio Miranda, with whom she also taught, and Sergio del Fierro, whom she was married to. Liliana Lanata's voice generally tends to fade next to her husband's, uh, Germán Banen. Together, they led uh, design studios at UCE for two decades, between 1978 and 1998. Although she was never professionally associated with Banen, according to her son, she collaborated informally in an important part of his work. 
Lanata also developed and drew projects for other architects, such as Sergio Elton between 1962 and 1968, Joaquín Izaguirre between 1968 and 1972, and Guillermo Veranda from 1972 onward. Doctorates. On another note, we would like to put a light on two voices that early on entered the highest traditional academic in Devoir, Margarita Green-Zuniga and Cristina Felsenhardt rosen Margarita Green uh, graduated in 1972 and obtained a master's degree in sociology at UC in 1988. She later joined the UCL Bartlett School of Architecture, where she participated in a research led by Bill Hillier about space syntax methodologies. During the 1990s, back in Chile, she worked as a consultant and advisor for the government and other institutions and became a full professor at UC. In 2002, she obtained her doctorate degree in built environment from UCL. Cristina Felsenhardt combined her work as a researcher with, this, with her studio Tierra Firme and her role as head of the first postgraduate course in landscape architecture in the country, officially launched in 1989. Born in Poland, she studied at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia and was hired as an assistant professor at UC in 1974. In the 1980s, she went to Barcelona with a scholarship granted by UC to specialize in landscape architecture. She went for a master's degree and came back with a doctorate degree. From the 1990s onwards, she has researched the links between the culture and territory of Chile. Administratives. Two years after graduating from the Catholic University of Valparaíso, um, I think it's the next slide, thank you. In 1972, Juana Sunino Muratori took courses at the DDA chaired by Esme Gromi. When the DDA was dissolved, she looked for a job that was compatible with parenting. She was hired by SEA magazine in 1978 and worked there until 1992 as part of the editorial team. In 1997, she entered the postgraduate program in landscape architecture, and three years later, she became head of the program. In that position, Sunino combined her interest in landscape with the tools acquired in the editorial world. In another manner, after decades of professional cancellation due to political reasons during the dictatorship, with the return to democracy, Jimena Gutierrez Lopez de Heredia was hired as head of the regional control unit, UCR, of the National Regional Development Fund, FNDR. She worked in Santiago until 1999, when she applied for the same position in Tarapacá. Toward her retirement, she decided to move to the Valparaíso Division in order to be able to live near to her family. And finally, feminists. Finally, we would like to highlight two voices that developed their, her, their practice with gender consciousness. Jimena Gutierrez de Heredia is the only voice we conferred a twofold role. 20 years before her work at the FNDR, she was a pioneer in the problematization of her condition as a woman architect. The research seminar Woman and Work, which she directed between 1970 and 1973, was an unprecedented space for discussion about the condition of women in the modern world at the UC School of Architecture. The document that served as the basis for the course was her final thesis, which had the same name. Margarita Pisano Fisher was an especially powerful voice within the second wave of the feminist movement in Chile. Together with Julieta Kirkwood, Pisano participated in the foundation of the autonomous feminist movement and a space for reunion and political debate called Casa de la Mujer La Morada. Over the years, Pisano became an authority within the circles, circles of feminist 
act activism and Dano is mentioned in the analyzed writings have nothing to do with her political activity, which was deeply rooted in the concerns about the participation and representation of women in the urban space. Instead, her name appears due to two projects that she designed together with Hugo Gaguero, with whom she was married until 1983. This reflects the importance of the criteria that determine historical judgment when interpreting our history. As Susana Torres suggested, the question, why have there not been great women architects, might be wrongly conceived. Alternative questions could be what cultural, historical and political circumstances condition the work of women in architecture, or what roles and ways of working did they adopt. Or maybe, and how does this impact the way in which we build stories about architecture? Documenting the contribution of women to architecture is still a fundamental step to deconstruct gender hierarchies in our field. This provides possible reference models for young students and reverses the absence of women architects in the dominant historiographic con constructions about our past. It also implies questioning the normative precepts of historical value and opens other spaces to expand the historization of architecture. This is why we need to read between the lines, explore the interstices and look again through their cracks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manola Barbara. I think I must introduce now Javiera and uh, is only Javiera around? Or? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I think Go Valentina ahead. was here, but I'm the one who's going to present. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you also to Ana, Manola, Barbara, and Carolina for the previous presentation. Uh, just give me a minute. Okay. Do you see my screen, right? Mm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation and a good evening, good morning <laughs> to everyone. Uh, my name is Javiera. Um, this presentation is called A Woman Architect Among Men, Ilda Carmona, Teacher and Design. Ilda Carmona Lowe is an architect who dedicated her professional life to design and teaching. A powerful creator of architectural projects, she was also the first design studio professor at the School of Architecture in Pontificia Catholic University of Chile, or UC, or UC in Spanish. <laughs> she became an outstanding designer and a memorable professor in a predominantly male context. Although she frequently worked as part of teams, she stood out individually as a female architect in a world of male architects. Both through her pioneer work in the field of architectural education and her remarkable design project, Carmona made a significant contribution to the discipline. Nevertheless, Carmona's legacy has tended to fall into oblivion, overshadowed by the names of the architect with whom she collaborated. So these pre presentations aim to make her work as an architect and educator visible. This presentation is part of the research project called Entre Líneas, mentioned before by Manola and Barbara. The presentation is based on a chapter of our book Between Life between Lines, Rereadings of History Through Female Architects in Chile, which will be launched today. <laughs> I believe the invitation uh, there. Okay, so in 1926, 75 years after the opening of the first architecture course in Chile, the first woman architect graduated from the University of Chile, Dora Rieder. Three years later, in 1928, women got access to architecture studies at the UC. The first two architecture students at Catholic University were Maria Elena Vergara and Violeta del Campo. 
During the 1930s, eight women followed their steps, and in 1950, the enrollment of female students reached 18. This pioneer encouraged other universities to admit female students into similar programs. In the mid 1960s, the entry of women into architecture studies increased exponentially in the country. Later, during the 1970s, women accounted for more than 20% of the total number of architecture students at the University of Chile and the Catholic University. However, the low visibility of, visibility of the contribution of the first generations of Chilean female architects is clearly evident in the historiography of modern architecture in Chile, full with male names. We are familiar, we are familiar with the names of Emilio Duarte, Sergio Larraín, Roberto Dávila, Carlos Brechani, Héctor Valdés, uh, Fernando Castillo, Carlos Garcia Huidobro, and many others. But where are the names and disciplinary, disciplinary contributions of female architects? What about the modern female architect who made great contribution and has not been named or recognized for it? The purpose of this presentation is to tell the story of a particular architect. Despite having a prolific work, her name seems to have been absolutely forgotten for the dominant story about modern architecture in the country. In fact, the projects were published in books and magazines, but only, but on many occasions, her name does not appear in, on the author list. Ila Carmona Lowe was an architect who graduated from the School of Architecture of Catholic University in 1964. Six years later, she became the first woman to be a dis design studio professor at the school. In parallel, she worked in different architectural studios where she developed projects with numerous partners and collaborators. In the 90s, she decided to specialize in landscape architecture. Ila Carmona Lowe was born in Tacna in 1926 and entered the architectural program at the UC in 1947 at the age of 21. In her years as a student, Ila Carmona experienced two forms of training, both art and modern, and had the opportunity of work with future architects and professors such as Sergio Larraín, Jorge Elton, and the Brechani Valdez Castillo Huidoro Studio. Her years as a, studio, as a student ended with the development of her final project called Headquarters of the Catholic University in 1954 and which she developed together with Hugo Aguero, Jorge Diaz, and Fernando Taura. Due to the outstanding results, the dean of the faculty at that time, Sergio Larraín García Moreno, commissioned her to renovate the library of the UC School of Architecture. In parallel, Hilda began to develop small projects and renovation for the UC together with her colleague and friend, Jorge Diaz. In 1961, the dean of the faculty of engineering, Raúl Deves, commissioned Carmona and Diaz the design of the Faculty of Engineering of the Catholic University of San Joaquin campus, which they designed in collaboration with the architect Jaime Vesa. The project is a composition of two-story concrete pavilion that surround a central count yard, which function as a civic space. Because of its clear structure and logic, the building was able to resist Expans, expansions and transformations. In the middle of the design process, Jorge Diaz has to abandon the project, so the team was reduced to two, Jaime Besa and Hilda Carmona. However, either because of a typing error or intentional omission, Hilda Carmona is not mentioned in the description of the project when it was published at, in the AUCA magazine in 1967. In 1963, as part of the implementation of San Joaquin Campus Master Plan by Germán Brandes for the new UC campus, Carmona and Diaz were hired by the UC to carry out renovation and smaller construction for five years. In this context, the studio of Jaime Besa, Jorge Diaz, and Hilda Carmona developed the project of the Faculty of Physis Physical and Mathematical Science in 1961. The building was also published in the AUCA magazine, but Ilas Carmona names was omitted again. In this case, the project is based 
on a series of volumes where a set of pavilions are arranged in a Cartesian manner around two central courtyards. Although the name of Hilda Carmona is not mentioned as part of the team of professional in the publication of AUCA, the original documents of both projects certify and demonstrate that Carmona participated in its design alone with the other two architects. Two years later, in 1963, Carmona, Besa, and Diaz developed its third major project for the university, the new UC Clinical Hospital in San Joaquin campus. It was a modern university hospital designated to healthcare, teaching, and research on a site of around 2,000 acres. The important work of the three architects was key to the first construction of San Joaquin campus. The proposal for the faculties of engineering, physical science, and mathematics and medicine are developed according to each program, but they share a configuration based on buildings that make up central voice and generate collective space for students. Architects gave great importance to circulation, as in the case of an external staircase that constitutes it in itself an element of plastic value. In addition to work with Besa and Diaz, Carmona collaborated with several renowned figure and architectural studios at that time. At a, as a student, she works in the studio of Jorge Elton with Sergio Larraín García Moreno and Mario Pérez de Arce Lavín. Also, she worked during 1951 in the prolific Brechani Valdez Castillo Guidoro studio. Subsequently, the architect worked in the field of design with the team she put together with her husband, Sergio Del Fierro, and Sergio Miranda, with whom she also led a design studio course at, at the UC. According to Camila Del Fierro, daughter of Del Fierro and Carmona, at the studio, Del Fierro was in charge of public relations and dealing with clients. Miranda was focused on the development of preliminary projects and site visits, and Carmona was focused on the development of the project for execution. The studio operated at Vasco, Gama, Vasco de Gama 4620, a house studio designed by the Del Fierro y Carmona in 1965 as a self-commissioned project. In addition to the residential programs, the house had a studio where the couple met with colleagues, friends, and students. This allowed Carmona and Del Fierro to make their professional practice compatible with the caring of their children by keeping them close to the studio. Del Fierro Carmona Miranda focused mainly on the design of housing projects and the composition of the work teams varied case by case. In fact, on many occasions, the studio invited external architects to participate. They planned urban development, developed projects for their private employees, provident fund or MPART, and participate in competition of the Housing Corporation or Corby. Among the projects in which Hilda participated, the Cotecna Complex in Vitacura, 1969. Stand out, developed together with Sergio del Fierro, Hugo Gaguero, and Germán Brandes, as well as La Pampa Complex in Conchalí in 1965, conceived with Del Fierro and La Torre. Among its projects are the El Cortijo Town, the Floriana Town, the San Carlos de Apoquindo Complex, the Las Encinas Urbanization, and the Quilicura Urbanization. Later, together with his partners, Del Fierro and Miranda, and now together with Elizabeth Huge, Hilda Carmona developed an agency for the Banco Concepcion in Providencia. Mm -hmm. However, a deep analysis and criticism of Carmona's extensive build legacy is still pending. Is still a pending work. After graduate from university, Ila Carmona immediately began to collaborate in the library, then followed by Emma Acevedo and Carmen La Fuente. According to her CV, Ila Carmona began working as a full professor in the 1955, 
but according to the official records of the UC School of Architecture, she was hired in 1960. That year, Carmona started teaching the design studio for third year students, along with Jorge Larraín, both in the school official records and in her CV. Carmona was hired as the course main professor. However, the book, 19 Years of Schools, indicate that she was a teaching assistant in the course, which was directed by Larraín. This incongruity suggests that the omission of women in the historiography of architecture has less to do with empirical fact than in, with the way in which those facts, facts has been interpreted. For more than five decades, Carmona lectured intermediately and as a complement to his work in the studio. In addition to the design studio course she led with La Reine, years later, she was a design studio professor with her associate, Sergio Miranda. She was a guiding professor for a series of degree projects. And in the case of the architects, Jose Rosas and Pedro Banen, among others. In a complementary way, between 1967 and 1968, Hilda was a part of the team of academics who collaborated with Juan Borges in both versions of his seminary, Amronia Arquitectonica. The teaching team also included Hernán Riesco, Isidro Suárez, Jorge Larraín, Sergio Miranda, and Carlos Alberto Cruz. Finally, toward the end of her teaching career, Carmona participated as the design studio professor in the postgraduate course in architecture and landscape management. In addition to her work inside the classroom, Carmona actively participated in other activities carried out by the school academics. In 1961, she participated in the trip to Mexico, organized by Sergio Larraín and a group of professors and students to attend to the second Latin American Congress of the School and Faculties of Architecture, representing the UC. In 1972, she participated in the 1972 International Competition for the Remodeling of Santiago, together with Hernán Riesco, Sergio del Fierro, Sergio Miranda, Isidro Suárez, and Juan Ballester. The competition received more than 87 projects from 25 different countries. The Chilean team that Hilda Carmona was part of obtained the honorable mention. Their project proposed a central pedestrian corridor connecting to connecting the interior passages, forming a super block. Carmona became a professor for a number of students who today remember her as one of the few female academics in on those years. According to Pedro Vanen, Tita Carmona was German, rigorous, aseptic, precise, but at the same time, very warm. Her invisibility is writing, is written history is different from the insistence in which her name appears in oral histories, where she is generally remembered by the nickname Tita. It is curious to think how, despite the impact she has on the student and on and the school, her name renamed and remains unknown to recent generations. Sorry. <laughs> Ila Carmona also became interested in the area of landscape. Uh, that disciplinary field started with the creation of the UC Department of Environmental Design in 1971, which was gradually defined thanks to the substantive work of a group of landscape architects from different generations and with different trajectories. Carmona joined the efforts to consolidate the field carried out by Marta Viveros, Carlos Marner, Elizabeth Huge, Francisco Schmidt, and Miriam Beach. In 1989, this group formed the Chilean Institute of Landscape Architect, ICHAP, which was established as the Chilean affiliate for the International Federation of Landscape Architecture, IFLA. In this context, between 1989 and 1990, Carmona was part of the first generation of students who obtained the new postgraduate degree in architectural and landscape management, a, group, a program that was led by Cristina Felsenhardt and Marta Viveros. 
The landscape postgraduate degree was created in 1989, headed by Christina Felsenhardt in coordination. The program was made, in, made it possible to officially concentrate the efforts, course, seminar, and talks on landscape that has been held in the school since 1971. Miriam Beach, Ilda Carmona, and Catalina Boch were part of the first promotion of the program and then continued to be linked to its academics. The following year of their specialization, Carmona Felsenhardt directed the minimum postgraduate course Design Studio 2. Then in 2001, both architects created the course called Taller Sur, which has the Conguillo National Park as its theme. In that period, Carmona again experienced teaching and professional practice. Now a special, specialization specializing in the area of landscape architecture. Among others, she participated in the Santa Monica Park project in Recoleta in 1992 of Montalegre Beach Architectos Studio. As a landscape architect, as well as in La Papilla Urban Park in Coquim. This way, Ilda Carmona began to lead the landscape treatment of urban complexes, towns, and projects through public space. Hilda Carmona was able to balance her professional performance between various forms of practice and disciplinary topics. She was a pioneer in working as a design studio professor at the UC, and during her, fifth, her 50 years as an academic, she left an unmeasurable mark on her students. The architect began in the profession at a very young age with her first project at the UC, then developed an impressive professional career with a large number of housing, educational, public, and landscape projects. In parallel to her built project, she was always linked in, way, in one way or another to teaching. Even more, she discovered the discovery of landscape as a disciplinary specialty, expanded architecture education within the university. Carmona's influence on education and built architecture is evident in the various areas of interest that she developed throughout her career as a professional, academic architectural design practitioner and landscape architect are just some of the professional roles, roles that she played. During her professional practice, Carmona transmitted her knowledge to different generation of students at the UC School of Architecture, managing to influence a large number of architects. In the word of her colleague, Cristina Felsenhardt, Hilda Carmona as a professor did more architecture than she did, given that education plays a primary role in the development of the discipline, we think that teaching also implies doing architecture. It is important to know that throughout her professional practice, Hilda Carmona was always part of a team, generally as the only woman in the group. Even so, despite Carmona's building legacy and teaching work, her name is often reduced or hidden behind the names of other male architects of the time. For this reason, revealing the unknown story of Hilda Carmona Law is recognizing the work and exploration of the discipline of a female architect in a world of male architects. The proportion of Female students in architectural program has continued to increase significantly over time. In a record from 2014, clearly a century after women first entered the field of architecture, we can observe that the student radio between men and women seen in the 1960s has inverted. Now, 64% of students are women and 36% are men. However, despite the visible increase in university enrollment, it is striking how silent the professional participation of, their of these first women seems to have been, as well as the lack of knowledge of, this of their work. Uh, it is necessary to look at the past again, not only to vindicate the individual roles of women in the discipline, but also to highlight the reference figures for all current and future architectural students. Thank you.
sorry. Thank you, Javiera. So we have now uh, a few minutes for discussions or or questions. Or, um, I, I will ask first for uh, the the speakers to have some uh, comments or or questions uh, between others. Yes, Ma Gabriela is. May I? Uh, yeah. I'll just. Uh, okay. I just have to say that I am amazed by the research that I have been presented here. It's amazing contribution. Uh, architects whose names I didn't know, and lots and lots of more information. So much needed, and the way you are systematizing this information is very, very useful and very, very relevant. I would, lo I would love to have uh, the contacts of you and to know more about uh, your researchers. And thank you very much and congratulations for your research. Okay, thank you, Ana Gabriela. Carolina, Barbara, Manola, um, Javiera. Um... I would like to try to build a, a comment. Um, my English is somewhat rusty, so I'll try to build it as, as I think. Um, but what I really liked about the presentations today is that um, the categories each of, of us used were very different. So I like that uh, Ana Gabriela kind of like focused on buildings that were produced by, by women and also like this geographical categories that, that you proposed and that um, in comparison to that uh, I liked how Carolina kind of like um, tried to state this different ways of doing architecture and also to problematize the question of who make architecture like do you have to study architecture to really be part of 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 the um, of the disciplinary discussions, and then well, in our case, um, actually, uh, and I, I'm going to talk about entry lineage as a whole. So I'm going to put Javiera and Valentina also together with with Manola and myself because we had these discussions as a group. Um, well, we also we what we uh, presented with um, Manola today, as we also said, was like a a different set of categories that the ones that we have in our book and which are also like this um, categories that um, Javier used in her presentation. So it was more like in our case to find kind of like roles, like professional roles. And then on the other hand, Javier that like focused on one and showed how one person also had a lot of different um, roles in itself. So it's less of a question, more of a comment, but I really liked how like we showed um, our different approaches also produce different discourses. Um, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. I would also like to say something. Go ahead, so, go ahead. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ana, Ana Aurela for your generous comments. We are very happy. Um, I also would like to say that um, it seemed very significant that there are so many um, dissertations and theses at the moment being written, apparently, <laughs> in Brazil um, about uh, women architects. I think that's very um, important. Um, I think that is to an extent also happening in Chile, which also make us, uh, makes us very happy. Um, but I think there is a lot to do <laughs> still. Um, I also would like to uh, comment on these obstacles you mentioned about uh, working with archives when studying women architects. Um, I think to an extent, we also had um, similar problems. So it made a lot of sense that you recognize those three um, kinds of obstacles. And I don't know, just thank you for, I just, 
I wrote a lot of names, <laughs> so that's uh, very interesting. I have like this huge list of <laughs> Brazilian and Argentinian architects, which is, is obviously um, amazing and a contribution for us too, because I think we sometimes I have the feeling that we know more about Europe and North America than of Latin America to an extent. So thank you. Okay, Carolina, Javiera, no? Yes, and uh, I, uh, well, really like the Ana Lela presentation, but I hear her many times and it's always a, a new learning with you. <laughs> But uh, but I'm really impressed about the presentation of the Chilean architects, and uh, because I think it's um, a very well uh, also structured, not the presentation, the way of thinking, and uh, also interesting about these categories, about to open, you no, know, about these ways of um, practice architecture. And uh, I think this is uh, very important, especially for women, because uh, like um, you hear here, was not so easy to practice, practice in the canonical way of practice to, to do a building, no? For example, yeah. Delfina Galpens have eight children to take care beside to design the house. So um, I think it's necessary to um, uh, to have another categories, not another uh, particular categories to understand what was the context, political, civil rights. You cannot put your signature in the dragons. A lot of context you need to understand. So about Chile is a very impressed me. <laughs> a very good the research. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Carolina. I like to know more. I like to know more. <laughs> Javiera. Uh, yes, thank you. And a short comment, Carolina. We uh, we're gonna. I, I don't know how you say this in English, but we're gonna launch our. <laughs> I don't launch. know. Launch, our, launch yes, our book. Yes. Yes. At yes. Seven p.m. in Chile. I think it's gonna be transmitted. Uh, so I cannot be there. If you want to know, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more, we have a website also. And but I wanted to thank Anna and Carolina. Uh, uh, it's a common similar to the to Barbara's, but I think that it, it's interesting. Interesting how. Uh, the three groups, uh, I'm going to talk like Barbara, Manola, Valentina, we're the same group, <laughs> a different presentation, but we are the same team. Uh, we had to look like outside, uh, in the case of Ana, outside from Sao, pa Sao Paulo and, and Rio. Uh, no, yes, no, yes. Sí, Rio, yes. Sao Paulo. Um, and Carolina, outside from uh, who teach, oh, um, sorry, who study architecture, but that doesn't mean it's less value her works. Uh, our women are architects, or maybe not, not architects, uh, but women who made architecture that uh, has a value work, important work, a uh, very impressive work. Uh, like Manola, I wrote many names <laughs> um, and I think that uh, is scary at the beginning be because you have to present like okay we have this those names that are not on this list but they made a great contribution to the discipline and I think that we can uh, make bigger the list uh, bigger and bigger and bigger by doing that exercise. Mm. Yes, and yes. one thing uh, I forgot to mention is not uh, other ways to practice, it's the practice. Yes. Because the practice is 
very complex and very rich. And uh, I told, uh, I didn't mention, for example, research, theory, uh, teaching, of course, uh, so many important women did were uh, professors, but I like to focus in these everyday buildings you see everywhere, for example. Um, this is very uh, another uh, dimension, but I, I really like to 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 change these others. <laughs> we have to change the other things. So the other modernism, the other practice, the other is the practice, I think. Yeah, uh, I think you are you are doing this. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, because I I can I I want to put in a different in a different what can I say in a different place the the in some in some way address the same discussion, but mm. uh, with the this kind of difference you are putting in the history of architecture, because. Uh, we can we can clean the 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 field um, with the obliterated cases like Delfina Galvez uh, is the case or the case I I put uh, some time ago with uh, True Schoder, who was actually the the only one who has who had studies on architecture in Hamburg, and Ridbell hasn't. Uh, yes. had, Yes, that was pretty clear. And in the very first times, the the buildings published with the name of both authors. It's the same case of Delfina Galvez, which is clearly obliterated. The second is the way we are obliterating people without uh, uh, gender in the first time when we talk about some buildings. I'm, Every time I think in 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 this case, I'm, I'm I I think in in uh, what was the name in in Gustavo Saavedra and Juan Martinez de Velasco. As you know, they uh, design with Juan O'Gorman the uh, library of the um, university campus in Mexico. And they were completely obliterated, and they had a very important role in the conception of the building. So, when you talk about the women in architecture as uh, women in a, in a kind of second place, uh, we are talking about also about every people in the second place not only women, and I think it's a, a very important point to put uh, even women, but every second. And, and the, the main issue is, is that when uh, the, the uh, Entre Líneas team uh, check the history of architecture, they uh, you didn't check uh, the history of architects. Actually, you check you you check uh, the history of buildings, and the names came with the building. In some cases, is uh, quite difficult. So uh, we are talking about a kind of second place in, in the design. Yes. You are talking at, at this moment. What what a lot of kind of of works in the we can uh, assume like an expanded field so you are doing uh, a very important uh, new methodological approach to the history of architecture first it's not only the history of buildings second is the history of a practice third is a history of a practice that combined plenty the first uh, the first name with the second names or the third even in each case. And the, the roles are changing in that way because uh, in the case of Matilde Letich, it was pretty clear that all the 
the uh, what can I say the construction work was in in her hands. It's clearly at that at that time Hano was out of the of the building construction issues. So uh, you are we, we are talking also a very kind of of relationship in between roles in the firms, you know, and it, that is really interesting because it it is not only because of female architects are doing work that it is because you are uh, doing an effort in a new uh, methodological way to to uh, write a history of architecture i think this is a very uh, very important issue and I congratulate you in in that sense, and of course congratulate uh, the Entre Líneas group because the book they are launching launching today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maracio and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. you no, we have, as always, a very precise conclusion. Horacio, always. <laughs> and yeah, uh, no. I like, yeah, I like to add one. Uh, uh, so many bibliography, but Ines Moisset is researching about specifically about the canon, no? Linda Notchlin uh -huh. and Pollock about the canon. What means the canon was this power, system of power uh, that put. It, Yes, in on the top some iconical figures, especially male, and movements. Yep. No, what is brutalism? What is this? So this canon produce, of course, the erase and the suppression and uh, to put in the shadows, woman especially, but yep. also any other production. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So thank you so much, Barbara. You send us the the YouTube uh, uh, address for this evening. Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Uh, so and Trilce said, "See you next Tuesday. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Documento Conference 20." 24 and centro, arroba centro patrimonio. Uh, if you lose uh, lose it, any presentation at all in Centers Editas YouTube channel, and you can uh, uh, follow uh, there. So thank you so much. I hope to see you next time. And just remembering that please don't forget to present a proposal for of a session on this topic i need i think <laughs> it's needed it's needed so we must have a session on this topic such as others uh, so please it's uh, the deadline is september 30 so it's just pretty close so organize please uh, uh, between you mm -hmm. and and have a, a proposal and thank the, you so much. Thank you. And the people who conserve the heritage eh, is here, Mariana and Flavia, who did the restoration of the house. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I know. Yes, thank you. So, Ana Gabriela, please, I encourage you to, to <laughs> uh, present a session, just a few lines, because you know it's an open field, so it's it's very important to have it in the in the conference okay message received thank you what i feel <laughs> yes yes thank you so uh see you bye bye and for the students which are uh, still here see you next tuesday <laughs> bye bye thank, thank you bye bye thank bye. you so much bye everyone bye Gracias Carolina, gracias Bárbara, gracias.